The Passover. Early April of the year six, Nazareth and all the villages of Galilee were a bustle with excitement, but only in preparation for the annual journey to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. There was no rebellion, although the decree of Caesar Augustus had been received that a census was to be taken for collecting taxes. There was no uprising against Romans in that year six, either in Jerusalem or in Galilee. The high priests in Jerusalem had persuaded the resentful people that it would be of no use to resist. In Galilee, the hot-blooded Judas, who had stirred up the last rebellion after the death of Herod ten years before, tried but failed to start another. Around the Sea of Galilee, he found some ready followers again, but none near that great city, which had been ruined by Varus. The men of Nazareth shook their heads. The memory was still too vivid of those rows of crosses upon which thousands of their neighbors had died. They would not risk of another wholesale crucifixion. The Roman census was taken every 14 years. So if, according to Luke, Jesus had been born at the time of the last census, he was now 14. But according to Matthew, he may have been only 12. And this would be his first journey to Jerusalem. To be considered a man, a son of the law, and to be going to the great feast of the Passover, that was a thrilling time in a boy's life. He could almost feel how his ancient ancestors must have felt at the time of the first Passover, when they learned they were to follow Moses out of Egypt to the promised land. The previous weeks and days in the village were filled with preparation. Each traveler must be dressed in his best homespun and each have a fresh newly bleached head covering to wear. The journey would take three days so tents had to be provided, sleeping rugs rolled up, baskets of food packed and bottles of wine filled. Small groups of men arranged to pull their money and purchase a lamb together for the sacrifice. They elected one man to take charge and represent them when they got there. Then one early morning, all was ready and the procession started. Men and boys on floor, the women riding donkeys. As they left the village, someone burst into song and they all joined in. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord, thought the boy, how wonderful it would be, silent and beautiful with all the people kneeling. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem, they sang. The shortest route to Jerusalem from Galilee ran directly straight through Samaria, but the people from Nazareth were soon turning east instead towards the Jordan River. There, on the outskirts of manufacturing city, they joined by a large they were joined by a larger company of pilgrims coming down from Calpurnia and other places along the Sea of Galilee. Here the company divided. Some crossed the Jordan to avoid even the edge of Samaria. Others, less fearful that the dust of the wicked nation would pollute their feet, continued along the west bank of the winding river. The valley sank lower and lower and grew hotter and hotter as they went south. At Jericho, they were joined again by those who had crossed the river. Jericho, this city then was Jericho, thought the boys, who were seeing it for the first time. This was the place where the people from Egypt had entered the promised land. This was the spot to which Joshua had led them after Moses had died. This was Jericho, the city that Joshua had captured. Around the campfires that night, the old legend was told again of how the walls of Jericho had come tumbling down. How seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark of the Lord blew their trumpets and the armed men before them and the people following went round the city for six days. And on the seventh day they went around seven times. And at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, the people shouted with a great shout and the wall fell down flat and they took the city. That had happened 1,200 years ago. Jericho, which had, which then must have been a crude little town, was now a most beautiful city of palaces and theaters, of rose gardens and groves of palms. There to be seen was the palace which Herod had built, and also the new palace and gardens of Archelaus, in which he would never live again, for Herod's son had now 
been banished by the Romans, the first new governor sent out from Rome would be in Jerusalem for this Passover. Jerusalem was now only 15 miles away. In the morning, leaving the Jordan River, which would soon lose itself in the Dead Sea, the pilgrims began the long climb to Jerusalem. Up, up they went, over steep barren hills, through a treeless, stony wilderness, wild and uninhabited, bleak and awfully compared to the fertile valleys and fields of Galilee. But who should complain? Was not the temple of the Lord at the end of the long, thirsty climb? It was late afternoon when they rounded the top of the last hill, the Mount of Olives, and there, across the valley, was the temple. There, Jesus saw it for the first time, the beautiful golden roof of the temple shining in the sun. That night, the country people of Nazareth pitched their little tents among the thousands of others on the hillside. The next evening at sundown, the first day of Passover would begin. Early in the morning, they were on the viaduct leading over to the valley to the temple. Crowds of people from everywhere were moving in the same direction. There were crowds as they entered the porch of Solomon. They were gathering about the teachers of the law, some of whom had on their wrists as well as their foreheads. Uh, Roman soldiers in their helmets were marching along the roof and across the great outer courtyard into which they now passed. That too was filled with seething crowd of all kinds of people. Country folks like themselves, haughty townsmen dressed in long silk robes, banded like them with fur and glittering with jewels and with gold chains swinging from their necks. Poppers, beggars in rags, handsome Greeks in short tunics, rich Jews from Egypt and Asia, visitors from Rome in fashionable togas, old men in tightly curled beards, young men in high striped turbans, white skins, brown skins, black, slaves following their masters, carrying bags of gold, tailors with bright young yarns threaded through their earlobes, the money changers with earrings of gold coins, tradesmen of all kinds going to or coming from the southern porch where each trade had its booth. Scribes with goose quill pens sat at the tables writing prayers on parchment for the crowds of onlookers to buy. Porters passed carrying crates of pigeons. Back and forth went the people, gathering in knots to talk, arguing, laughing, squabbling, chatting in every kind of voice and language. Confusion and babble were everywhere. The sound of bugles came from the fortress. From the inner court came the sound of trumpets, the chanting of psalms, singing, the muffled bleeding of sheep, the nearby rattle of money being dropped into the funnels along the wall. For now they had climbed the steps and were inside the inner court, the court of the women. There was a balcony over the next gate where the mothers could sit. But a 12-year-old boy could go into the court of Israel with the men, some pushed in front of them to get nearer to the railing for a better view. Priests in their white robes were moving back and forth. The altar was smoking. A chorus of Levites were singing, but the words were soon drowned out by the sound of hoofs. The, men, the man elected from Nazareth had gone around to the north gate to bring the lamb with, when his turn came. The priests now raised their silver trumpets and blew their three blasts. Twenty or more men came in, leading as many lambs. Each placed his hand on the head of the lamb to lay upon it the sins of those for whom it had been sacrificed. Then, twisting its head to face the temple, each one drew his lamb on the pavement and slit its throat. The blood gushed out. Priests caught it in bowls, golden bowls, and poured it on the base of the altar. The dead lamb was then hung on a hook, the hide removed by the butchers, the fat cut off and burned with a piece of meat on the altar. That was all. The part of Nazareth in the service was over. They went out while the priest blew three blasts on the trumpet and more lambs came in. The evening air was cool and sweet on the hillside as they ate the Passover meal just after sunset. Over an open fire, turning on a spit, the lamb brought back from the temple was roasted whole. The pale moon came up. Seated in a circle, they sang the psalms which the Levites had sung at the altar, each word full of meaning. 
O praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants, the name of the Lord, our God who dwelleth on high. When Israel went out of Egypt from the people of strange language, the sea saw it and fled. Jordan was driven back. The mountains skipped like rams and little hills like lambs. The wine was blessed and each one drank a cup. Bitter herbs were eaten, dipped in vinegar, sweetened only with dates and raisins. What, what mean ye by this service? A boy's voice asked, and in each circle a vo- father's voice replied, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Egypt while he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. Unleavened cakes were then eaten with another cup of wine, and then came the Passover lamb, which must all be finished by midnight. In closing came the singing of three more psalms of praise. O praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. For his merciful kindness is great towards us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Jesus did not sleep at once. He lay awake, watching the stars above the roof of the temple, now shining softly in the moonlight. Was the Lord there now, he wondered? Confused and puzzled over many things he had seen and heard, he found many questions he wished to ask the teachers in the temple. They could tell him he felt sure, not the ones who made great show of praying with their arms raised, but the others with the wise, quiet eyes. In the morning, he was there in the porch of Solomon, talking with the wise men. One of the teachers he may have heard that morning was the great rabbi Hillel, for he was still living. So absorbed was the boy that he was not aware of when the company from Nazareth left from home for home. Nor did Joseph and his mothers know that he had tarried behind. But according to the story told by Luke, supposing him to have been in the company, they went on day's journey, and they sought him among the kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when his parents saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Knew ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not, saying, the saying which he spoke to them. And he went down unto them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And that is all we know of Jesus of Nazareth until 21 years later when he was over 30.